اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و اللہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم لیس البر ان تولوا وجوهکم قبل المشرق والمغرب ولكن البر من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر والملائكة والكتاب والنبيين وآت المال على حبه ذوي القربى واليتامى والمساكين وابن السبيل والسائلين والسائلين وفي الرقاب وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة والموفون بعهدهم إذا عاهدوا والصابرين في البأساء والضراء وحين البأس أولئك الذين صدقوا وأولئك هم المتقون اللهم اجعلنا من المتقين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ثم أما بعد once again السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we were talking about the ayat that precede this profound ayat. It's a very famous ayat. It's called Ayatul Bir. And I'll talk to you about its definition and some of its main lessons in a little bit. But to tie the arguments that have been flowing in this surah from before, the main conversation that has been taking place is the change of the qibla. And after the change of the qibla, there is a sudden, there's, there's somewhat of a change in subject. And that change of subject is the people of the book that hide the truth. And one of the truths they hide that we mentioned way back when we started this conversation was that they recognized the Qibla for what it was. And even after recognizing what it was, it was too big of a deal for them to change their direction, the Jews that is to say, and even the Munafiqun. And you have to understand the change of the Qibla tested two kinds of loyalties. On the one hand, you had the Muslims who had been praying towards the Kaaba, uh, or, or at least the Kaaba was in front of them in Mecca, the Sahaba, the, the Muhajirun. So they had been praying towards the, the Kaaba and the, the way the Prophet prayed so that the Kaaba was lined in with Aqsa. When the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina, not only was the Prophet's back turned towards the Kaaba because now Medina is between Jerusalem and, and Mecca. Not only is the Prophet's back turned to Medina, which we talked about before, but the Sahaba's back is also turned to Mecca. If their back is to Mecca as they face Al-Aqsa. Qibla hasn't changed yet. These are people that have had respect and reverence for the Kaaba even before they were Muslim. They would never turn its back and pray towards, they wouldn't put their back to the Kaaba and pray ever. In Islam or outside of Islam. And now all of a sudden their allegiances, their loyalties for the Prophet ﷺ are being tested. So, the, so Allah Azza wa could have revealed the change of Qibla way before. But He didn't because in it was a test of loyalties even for the Muhajirun. Then six months later when the instructions do come down, and eventually they do come down to the Tahweel al-Qibla, when that does happen, now there's a test of loyalty for the Ansar. Because the Ansar their entire lives have been praying, the Jews and the Christians have reverence for Jerusalem al-Aqsa. And if they're going to pray towards the Kaaba, they have to turn their back to Jerusalem. So in the beginning, the loyalties of the Muhajirun are tested, and later on the, the, the loyalties of the Ansar are tested, both of them. And this way, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Lina alama man yattabi'ur Rasul." We read this some time ago, so that Allah may know whoever, who it is, in fact, that truly follows the Prophet. Loyalties are being tested in the change of the Qibla. The timing of it was very strategic, so both of these groups of followers of the Prophet, their their metal, their loyalties, could be tested. Now, speaking in general terms, there's a certain, I call it religious psychology. You know, a certain mindset people have when, they, when they're patrons of a religion, when they follow a religion. This can happen to Muslims, it can happen to Christians, Jews, Hindus, whoever. That you can forget what the religion is actually about, and you get caught up in the details. You get caught up in the rituals and the details, the, 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 the technicalities, and you actually forget what those technicalities are actually about. For example, Hajj is around the corner, right? People are going to go, so many, hundreds of thousands, if not millions are going to go to Hajj. And some people will entirely be caught up in, you know, was that seven or six? How many tawaf did I make already? Where am I? They're keeping count. And that's important. 
or they're keeping count, and did I touch Hijra Aswad or not, or did I do Safa Marwa or not, did I do Sa'i or not, etc, etc. All those technicalities are important. But if a person forgets that I'm repeating the struggles of Ibrahim alayhi salam, I'm making, I'm performing a ritual that was performed by the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam when, when this deen was, con when this deen was given victory by Allah, I'm celebrating the honor of the victory of Islam given to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَدْحِ I'm doing that right now. These are, I mean, these are things you should be aware of when you're making hajj. Because this, is, this puts things in perspective. Yes, the technicalities are critical. But it, keeping the bigger picture in mind is also really, really important. It's a big part of what we're doing. Of course, the biggest thing that one should remember is that hajj is a simulation for judgment day. You know how in military training or fire department training and police department training, they do simulation exercises? Where they pretend there's a fire and they go through the drills and all of that? Well, what is what's going to happen on Judgment Day? There's going to be a huge crowd of people. They're going to be herded toward Arafah. They're going to be, they're going to be raised from their graves. And we literally wear the clothes that we can be buried in, the ihram. Not, not a thing with us. And everybody's pretty much equal. And everybody's standing before Allah, begging Allah's mercy. SubhanAllah. It's actually a review exercise for Judgment Day. That's what it's supposed to be. If a person doesn't remember that, you're going around making tawaf and texting friends. Hey, guess where I'm at? And that's happening nowadays, right? You, you missed the point. You missed the point. Now, the, the, the point I'm trying to make, this is not a conversation about Hajj, but the point I'm trying to make is there's a certain mentality that follows a religion, or follows some parts of a religion at least, and makes a really big deal out of those few things that they do follow, and they'll lose sight of what the entire deen is about. Like it's something bigger than these rituals. And so for people like that, these little things become a very big deal. Right? You make a big deal out of it, it'll become a big deal. You keep, it, you keep it in perspective, it'll stay a small deal. One of the most essential teachings in our religion is a sense of proportion. I'll say that again, it's a very important term, a sense of proportion. Everything has to be in due proportion. Our iman is a, is a, is a heavyweight thing. Our faith is a heavyweight thing, it has a proportion. There are daily acts that we do that have a heavier weight than other acts that we do. You know, the, the fard prayers are of a heavier weight than the sunnah prayers and then the nawafil and the additional prayers. There's a sense of proportion between actions. Just like that, there are a sense of priorities in our deen. And when people lose that, you know, they don't have the proper sense of proportion that Allah gave. Look, this is priority number one. Then if you've taken care of that, here's what you can do, number two. And if you're taking care of all of these essentials, then you can beautify your religion further with these further acts. Like if you don't have that sense of proportion, then you pick and choose whatever of the religion you want and that becomes your entire religion. You have no place to put it. it. It's not part of a bigger picture. You just have one piece of the puzzle. And so for some people who are following the religion, facing Aqsa was all there was to their religion. That was the big deal. How can we turn away from Aqsa? How can that be? How can a religion be right if we don't turn towards Aqsa? You know, I'll give you a crazy example of this. Where I come from in Pakistan, there are people who... You know, we've, we've done interesting things with Islam in Pakistan to say the least, okay? And one of the interesting things that's happened for a lot of people, they don't know much about the religion at all, but they do know some things about Salat. And they've seen in Salat, for instance, that every time the, you, you make Salat, after the Salat is done, the Imam makes dua out loud, after the prayer is done. I'm not talking here to you about the fiqh of that, the halal or halalness of that, or the, whether it's sunnah or bid'ah, I don't... That's not, I'm not qualified to talk about that anyway. But we all know that that is not a part of Salat, that's something that happens after the Salat. But they've seen it happen all the time, and they've never really learned anything more. I was at a masjid one time, the Imam gave khutbah, he, unfortunately he wasn't from Pakistan. And he's not part of that tradition where you at, right after the Salat, you raise your hands and you make dua out loud and everybody says Ameen. But this was a very concentrated Desi masjid. So the poor guy leads a great, gives a great khutbah, leads the salat, and he's just making dua by himself, quietly. Everybody's like, when's he gonna start? They're waiting for him to start. And he, does, he never does, he just does his tasbih, he makes his dua, and he just gets up and starts leaving, and somebody gets up and goes, salat didn't count. He didn't make munajat. He didn't make dua. <laughs> we have to repeat jum'ah. <laughs> Why did that happen? Because for some people, they don't, when they don't know especially, the, the few things that they do know are the most important things. That's all they have left of the religion. That's the only thing they're holding on to. So you can't shake that. They may be compromising everything else about the religion. The guy, the guy who said, repeat the Jum'ah, he may even be a liquor store owner. But Jum'ah should be done right. 
You know, there's one thing that you're holding on to, you better hold on to it exactly the way you're used to. You follow what I'm saying? So the people who were used to praying towards Aqsa, so there's no way praying towards Kaaba can be any good. There's no way. We're not going to change that. You get set in your ways and you just can't change. At that point when you get set in your ways, it doesn't even matter whether you're Muslim or Hindu or Christian or whatever, when you're set in your ways like that in certain rituals, then the evidences, the proofs, the, the statements of the ulama, the fatawa, none of this matters. You, the only reason is we do things this way. This is the right way to do it. That's it. That's your final evidence. And so Allah crushes that mentality in the next ayah. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ And he, before he even talked about this, the, the ayat right before, are people who were selling out the revelation, who were, who were hiding the, the word of Allah, you know. The, this was the conversation right before. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِي الْكِتَابِ لَفِي شِقَاقٍ بَعِيدٍ لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ Those who differed in the book, are, are far off. They created all these schisms and disagreements inside the religion. And now Allah says, one of the reasons that happens is people take one little bit of the religion and that becomes the entire religion for them. Let me tell you another way before I get into the ayah itself, very important, how this is creating fitna in our ummah today. You have people that represent this religion, they're supposed to be ambassadors of this religion. And they dedicate their entire careers talking about how that guy doesn't make salat properly. Because his, you know, he raises his hands before he goes into ruku, or he doesn't raise his hands before he goes into ruku. And that group of people, they're crazy because they pray 20 taraweeh. And that group of people are even crazier because they pray 8 taraweeh. And they're deviant, don't go near them. Their entire career is revolving around writing books that refute this guy or that guy or this group or that group or the other. That's their entire career. It's incredible. Like you have nothing more important to deal with in this deen. That's it. Because there's one thing in their religion, that's the one thing they know, and if that is changed in any way, oh, that's the end of everything. And they draw the attention of all the Muslims towards these things. To the point where, you know, that, that's all that's left of your faith. So you don't even, the, the greatest sunan of our Prophet ﷺ, courtesy, respect, dignity, you know, thinking, not, not making assumptions about the other. You'll walk into certain masajid with people with a certain mentality, and you walk in, I, this happened to me, I was praying in a masjid one time, it was a guy who was praying next to me. Was, we're in salah. By jama'ah. In maghrib salat. Salat ends, he turns to me and says, Assalamu alaikum. I said, Wa alaikum as salam. I, I took my hand out. He slapped my hand. He goes, no, that's bid'ah. I was like, well, what? Why'd you do that, man? And then he goes, by the way, you don't know how to pray. I was like, nice to meet you too. <laughs> you know? And he goes, your hands were here, they weren't here. I won't show you what he said. Right? Your hands were here, they weren't here. I was like, what were you paying attention to in salat, man? Are you like the, you know, the Salat auditor? <laughs> you just stand around checking who's praying how, and where their elbows are, and how their sajda is. He's in sajda, he's checking whether my, my nose is touching the ground or not. What are you supposed to be doing in your Salat? <laughs> you know? When a, when a sense of proportion is lost, then these, these, these finer things, and I'm not saying it's not important to put your hands in the right place, or make sajda properly. You know, I'm not saying any of that stuff. But I am saying, man, if that's all your religion becomes, there's a problem. That's a very serious problem. So the sense of proportion has to be reconstructed. So Allah reconstructs. What does it mean to be a good Muslim in this ayah? That's what this ayah is about. For non-Muslims who are narrow-minded in their view of Islam, and for Muslims who may lose the sense of proportion. Turning your faces to the east and west alone isn't all there is to righteousness. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ you know, the way I translated this, I won't go into the grammatical explanation for some of our, our students, I tortured them with that already. But you know, when, when a lot of translations say, turn, you know, it, is, it, it isn't righteousness. Righteousness is not that you turn your faces east and west. You're getting a call. It's okay, I declined it. Okay, sorry. Righteousness is not that you're, you're turning your faces east and west. That's actually not exactly what the ayah says. Because al-birra is mansub, it's got a fatha on it, which means it can't be the beginning of your sentence. What Allah is saying is turning your faces east and west isn't everything. Isn't all there is to righteousness. So please listen to this carefully. Is there a difference between saying this is not a glass of water or this is not a bottle of water and as opposed to saying this is not the only bottle of water? Is there a difference or no? When I say this is not a bottle of water, I'm wrong. Or I'm trying to convince you that it's not water. If I say this is not the only bottle of water, I do two things. One, I told you, in fact, this is a bottle of water. And two, what else did I tell you? There's others too. 
Now listen to the ayah. Allah did not say, it isn't good to turn your faces east and west. Allah said, turning your faces east and west isn't the only good. It's not the only good. What does that mean? Which, it means turning your face in the proper direction is good, but isn't the only good. That's not all there is to the religion. There's more to it than that. There's a bigger picture. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ Because this is changed from Maghrib, Mashriq to Maghrib. And remind yourself, in this surah before, Allah said, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّا وَجْهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ Wherever you may be. Allah said, Allah alone owns the east and the west. When wherever you may be, you will find the face of Allah. أَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا Wherever you may turn. He didn't even say turn to the qibla. Like he said in the second juz when it began, before that even, wherever you may turn, you'll find Allah's face. In other words, whether you're in salat or not, you're still facing Allah. Just because you're facing the Kaaba does not mean you're facing Allah. Wherever you're facing, you're still facing Allah. Allah is still watching. That's the right attitude. That's the right attitude. So now, after this, when the question is created, the, turning your faces in the proper direction isn't all there is? The question creates, it gets created in the mind, what else is there then? What else is there? So Allah answers that question in the rest of the ayah, وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّةِ However, goodness is, and let me talk a little bit about bir. The word bir in Arabic comes from bar, which means land. Which is the opposite of bahar, which is ocean. When a ship is in the ocean, when people are in the ocean, the ocean is unstable. They're at the mercy of the waves. If there's a storm, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ Allah says when the storm happens, people turn to Allah. When He rescues them, brings them back to land, then they become, go back to their shirk. Right? Now, Allah says goodness, the word goodness is, or, or rather the Arabs say goodness is connected to, the, to land. Because land is stable, you're safe. And evil is like the ocean, it's unstable. It puts you on unstable footing and you'll drown in it. You won't be safe when you commit evil. So this bir in and of itself has this idea of stability. And what we learn from that is that by use of this word, instead of khair for example, goodness is khair also. But bir means that Allah expects that the deeds that He's going to identify here aren't a seasonal thing. They're not just something you do once in a while and then you just do your, your thing after that. It's a stable attitude that you've internalized. It's become a part of you. Now, it's a little bit of a technical conversation. But nonetheless, bir, the Arabic word bir means goodness. And bar means a good person. Bar is a good person. It's a little bit longer with an alif in the middle. The plural of bar is abrar. وَتَوَفَّنَ مَعَ abrar. That uh, occurs in the Quran, right? So bir is goodness itself, and bar is a good person. Allah did not say, وَلَكِنَّ الْبَارَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ The good person is the one who believed in Allah. He didn't say that. Literally it translates, goodness is the one who believed in Allah. Which is very hard to understand. Goodness is the one who believed in Allah? You would think a good person is the one who believed in Allah. But Allah didn't use that. He used the maslad. This, this is a special usage in Arabic. It's done when you want to say the complete, you know, goodness manifests. Goodness is not a person, goodness is an idea. But if you want to see that perfect ideal, that idea of walking around in a human being, then you will see that person in real life if they, if they have these qualities in them. That person isn't just good, it's his goodness walking around. That is what goodness looks like. So Allah has highlighted that person's qualities to the point where you, that they've become a role model to others when they carry these attributes. May Allah give us these attributes. So, this, these attributes are now, I'm, I'm gonna build them like a building. You know the most important part of a building? When you're in construction? Foundation, you gotta dig a hole deep. You know when, when construction's going on, I used to go to a college in the city, in New York City, and there was a building being built across the street from our, our campus, completely fenced off, you can't see anything inside, and for years and years we thought nothing's going on. You know what they were doing all that time? Digging the foundation. Years and years, like six or seven floors deep. And then when they started building, within four months the whole thing was up, like 30 floors high. Like just crazy fast they built it. What did they take their time in six, seven years doing? Foundation. Foundation comes first. And by the way, when foundations are being built, nobody sees it. Foundation is secret. 
And even when the building rises, everybody sees what's beautiful above. What do, what do people not see? Foundation inside. What gives the tree its strength? Everybody appreciates the height of the tree, the fruits on the tree, the leaves on the tree, the shade of the tree. It's beautiful. But what is the most powerful part of the tree that holds it in its place? The roots. If not for the roots, a little bit of wind and the tree is gone. It is those roots that keep the tree in its place. Iman, faith, is that foundation. It's not something you can see. It's the roots. Where this personality is being constructed and the foundation is mentioned first. Man amana billahi, the one who believed in Allah. Wal yawmil akhiri, and the last day. Wal malaikati, and the angels. Wal kitabi, and the book. Wal nabiyyin, and the prophets. Several things have been mentioned now. Allah, the last day, the angels, the book, the prophets. A person believes in all of these. This order is also very powerful because this order has to do with goodness. This order has to, because this ayah is not about iman. This ayah is about what? Goodness. So the sequence is chosen because it has to do with goodness. Let's talk about that. The most, the most beautiful intention a human being can have to do good deeds is what intention? What's the best intention a person can have? They want to do a good deed. Yeah, I want to make Allah happy. I want to live Allah, we say. We say about the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum wa radu anhu. Right? Allah is pleased with them. That's the biggest goal they had in their life. Allah is pleased with them. So we make dua every time we say their name, radiallahu anhum. May Allah be pleased with them. May they achieve the goal they lived for. Their goal was to make Allah happy. Among the people, there's someone who sells himself trying to make Allah happy. Sells his life, gives his life up just so he can make Allah happy. This, this is the highest goal somebody can have. I am doing this. I'm staying away from haram. I'm doing the halal. I'm forbidding the. I, I, I'm implementing the mandatory in my life. I'm trying to do more and more and more good deeds. And the number one motivation in front of me is that Allah will be happy with me. That's it. That's number one. But that's not the only motivation. That's the highest motivation. Sometimes people do good deeds because they really like Jannah. Sometimes people do good deeds because they really don't like hellfire. Right? That's obviously good reasons to not do the haram. The haram is tempting. And you get closer to it, you say, I can sense the flames. I'm gonna just go the other way now. You know? Your iman, maybe at that time you're not worried about making Allah happy, you're more worried about not burning in hellfire. Is that still a good reason not to do bad deeds? Is Jannah still a good reason to do good deeds? Absolutely. Those are still good reasons. But they're not as high a reason as pleasing Allah Himself. That's the highest, that's ihsan. But underneath that, just because somebody wants to worship Allah or do good deeds because of Jannah or Nar, that's still not a bad reason. So Allah says, وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْ يَوْمِ الْآخِرِ And the last day, if your concerns were the last day and that drove you to do good deeds, that's good too. That's fine also. People will be at different levels. And as you start doing more good deeds, your iman increases. As your iman increases, you become more aware of Allah. When you become more aware of Allah, your love of Allah increases. When your love of Allah increases, you start doing things not for Jannah or not, but you do them because of your love for Allah. But you graduate to that stage. It doesn't start out like that. In the beginning, it may just be you want Jannah. Sahabi will come, some Bedouin will come, just became Muslim, says, tell me what I can do to get to Jannah. He won't say, tell me what to do to make Allah happy. He'll say, tell me what to do to get to Jannah. Tell me something so I don't go to hell. That's all he'll come and say. I just don't want to go to hell. Tell me what to do. How do I save myself from hell? Give me the bottom line. Now if he does those good deeds and he continues to progress, then he'll build a relationship with Allah. And at that point, then he may graduate to the higher reasoning, which is I want to make Allah happy. Probably today, inshallah, we'll dedicate our conversation just to the iman section. And next week, we'll, we'll continue and finish this ayah because it's a long ayah. Now, wal malaikati wal kitabi wal nabiyin. After that, Allah mentions the angels, the book, the prophets. The most common drive for people to do good deeds, it should be said, people that do good deeds, the most common thing that drives them to it is the akhirah, reward. Fundraisers use it a lot. Look at what Allah will give you back. Oh, He's going to hook you up. Just write the check, don't worry about it. It'll be awesome. The gates of Jannah, the gardens you'll get, the homes you'll get, the rivers that are going to be flowing. Look at this promise of Rasulullah and people just start seeing Jannah in front of them. 
And then finally, you know, shaitan is saying that entire time, hey, hey, keep it in the pocket, keep it in the pocket, keep it in the pocket. But then when a believer starts imagining Jannah a little bit more, they're like, hey, yeah, I gotta get that. Forget Villas of Andalus, I want that property over there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign me up. Sign me up. It happens. This motivation for good deeds is very powerful. At the same time, the, 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 the fear of hellfire is very powerful. I told you, right? Recently I told you there was this girl who stopped believing, came to me, and one of the reasons she said she has a problem with Islam is she's real problem with hellfire. She has a real problem with hellfire. And she, says, she says to me, you know, I, why, is, why is the punishment so harsh? Why is it so explicit in the Qur'an? This punishment, people burning, their faces burning, and skin peeling off, and all kinds of nasty stuff. Why should a person burn if they just, for, just for not believing they should burn? And I told her, what are you worried about? You don't believe it. It's just fiction to you. Why do you, so, you look so worried? You know, the fact that you look so depressed and worried means you believe it. Because <laughs> if you really didn't believe it, you would laugh at it. You know, this is what Allah tells us. For disbelievers, this world was beautified because there's no consequences. This, this, this world is all there is. So they make fun of the believers. If you really disbelieved, you'd be making fun of our belief. You wouldn't be disturbed about it. The fact that you're disturbed is telling me something. There's something in there that says it's coming. You don't like that it's coming. <laughs> you know? Be, at least be honest to yourself. Now, after this, Allah mentions the angels, the books, and the prophets for a reason. Okay, I want to be saved on judgment day. I want to make Allah happy. I don't know how. I don't know what to do. You know, before Islam came, people used to dance around the Kaaba naked, thinking that'll make Allah happy. And if you ask them, why are you doing it? I was like, I, I figured that might be a good idea. I don't know. Where did you learn it from? I kind of thought of that myself. Actually, it wasn't the, yourself. It was shaitan helped you along with that idea. But people didn't know. Maybe even if they had good intentions, I want to worship Allah, I want to thank Allah. They just didn't know how. They just had no idea. To know what Allah wants, you can either use your creative imagination, or you can have Allah teach you. How does Allah teach you and me? He delivers instructions. How does He deliver them? Through an angel. al malaika To do the good deeds, you need instructions that come from the angels. What do the angels deliver? Al-Kitab, that's the next thing mentioned, Al-Kitab. The, the angels deliver the book. Who do they deliver it to? When Nabiyyin and the Prophets. The person believes in the angels, the book, and the Prophets, because by believing in these three things, this person now has communication with Allah. Now he knows what Allah wants. If a person has no belief in angels and books and Prophets, then that communication is cut. Our relationship with prophets only exists because we believe they get a book. And we only believe they get a book because it comes to them from the angel. So these three things are connected because this is iman in ar-risala. So in these three statements, belief in Allah, belief in the last day, and then belief in risala, which is angels, books, and prophets. The package is now there. Two of those things, why do you do good deeds? And the other, what good deeds should you do? What is, it, what is a good deed anyway? How do I know what I'm doing is the best possible thing I could be doing? How do I know what I'm doing isn't wrong? I can't learn that on my own. Fathkurullaha kama allamakum. Ma lam takunu ta'alamun. You should remember Allah the way He taught you, the way you couldn't possibly have known yourselves. Ma lam takunu ta'alamun. The way you couldn't have known yourselves at all. You had no idea what to do. It's Allah that taught. Allam al Quran. He taught the Quran. That's how we learn. These three things now make the foundation ready. Now that the foundation is there, now you're ready to become good. The last thing I'll say about this foundation, and inshallah we'll talk about these good deeds next week. One of the most fundamental problems of Muslims, I'll forget non-Muslims for a moment. Forget non-Muslims for a moment. The Muslims today, our relationship with our religion. For, for the most part for Muslims, our relationship with Islam is nothing more than a culture. Handed out from our parents, handed down from our parents. And some of our Muslim kids raised, even if no matter where in the world they're raised, they think to themselves, man, if I was raised in a Hindu family, I would have been Hindu. If I was raised in a Buddhist family, I would have been Buddhist. If I was raised in a Christian family, I would have been Christian. I was raised in a Muslim family, so I'm Muslim. It's just a tradition, it's just culture. And when you see it as culture, then breaking culture, breaking culture is just, I mean, I'm getting along, I'm moving on and I'm living in the modern world, I'm not living in the past. 
If Islam is just a culture, then everything Islam has to offer is backwards. Because it has to do with the past. But you want to live in the future, you want to live in the now, you want to be modern. So you leave all of those things behind because you call them backwards. The fact that people call it backwards is in and of itself proof that they don't understand that this book is from Allah. And it's timeless, it's revelation. Like Allah is timeless. His instructions are timeless. They're permanently valid, they're not aged. They don't get old. Allah didn't send something and He didn't realize that one day there's gonna be a 2011. You know, there's gonna be modern technology. Oh, if Allah, and somebody even told me this at an Eid gathering of all places, Eid gatherings to ruin your mood. A guy tells me at the Eid gathering, you know, if Quran came down in 2011, it would have been different. And I said, dude, who would have sent the Quran down? Allah? Did Allah know there's gonna be a 2011? Does He know there's gonna be a 2070 if, if the world reaches that, that day? Who knows? Allah does. Allah knew humanity from the first human being to the last human being that will see the sun rise from the west. He knows all of them and He knows what guidance they need. And He decided that 1400 years ago would be the final message that will be relevant until Judgment Day. If you believe in a God that is eternal, all wise, all knowing, then that statement is problematic. Maybe you haven't really thought about what you believe. <laughs> that makes you say things like that. Because that's a really problematic thing to say. That our religion is backwards. Oh, that was just for the Prophet's time. No, it wasn't. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you as a mercy for all nations of the world. Even the Europeans, even the Americans, even the Australians, even the Turks, even the Africans. Everybody. We sent you as a mercy for all of them. That's what the Prophet has told. And now Muslims are saying, no, what the Prophet did was for his time. Muslims are saying this nowadays, it's crazy. And Allah is arguing now. Allah is saying, no, you're a mercy for everybody. For all time, permanently. This, these, this foundation, if it's not there, forget the rest of goodness. When you see the problems in the Muslim world like corruption, like a mockery of Islam, like a, the, the, the war against hijab, the war against hijab, you know, like the abuse of law, sharia, the abuse of sharia, like the manipulation of religion. You know what all of that is? Those are all symptoms. They're not the disease. And we get all worked up about the symptoms. We have to understand the disease is the foundation is cracked. You can't talk, complain about the building shaking and say we need to do something about the shaking building. What's the first thing that needs to be fixed? Foundation. When that foundation, and when we, and, and I know that I said that's the last thing in three minutes, I promise I'll wrap it up. When we talk about the foundation being fixed, usually we talk about something spiritual. People need to remember Allah, they need to make istighfar, they need to make tawbah, I agree entirely. But I say that's half the picture. Iman is two things. Iman on the one, like two sides of a coin. Iman on the one side, on the one side it's a spiritual experience. One has to remember Allah and feel the fear of Allah and love Allah Azza wa Jal and the tears should come down from their eyes when they make dua and they make tawbah and they make istighfar, that's the spiritual side of it. Then there's an intellectual side of it. One should understand with full confidence that this is the truth. And everything else that comes against it is batil. And this is superior to anything else that has ever come. And anything that will stand against it. And they should be convinced of it up here in their head, not just in their heart. In their head too. I say that because now our students go and they have good iman, they go to masjids, they go to Sunday school or you know, youth programs or whatever. Then they go take an anthropology course in college. And they take two philosophy courses in college. And their heart may be in the right place, but the mind starts wandering. Is there a God? Oh, all these religions are man-made. You know, those thoughts start coming. So we're not being attacked from the spiritual side, we're being attacked also from the intellectual side. When Allah builds this foundation of Iman and Allah, and the last day, and revelation, that foundation was built both ways, the hearts and the minds. That's what we learn in this surah too. Bani Israel, their hearts were corrupted, and they refused to think. Afala Why don't you apply your intellect? Think about it. This deen is based on proof. Ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin. I call to Allah with eyes open, with clear understanding of what I'm calling to. It's not a, you know they say blind followers, blind faith? Look at the expression in the Qur'an. Allah, Allah tells the messenger, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ Tell them this is my path. I call to it with eyes open, with basira, with full view. I know what I'm talking about. You're the ones that are following blindly. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي I and whoever follows me. I, I and whoever follows me also has their eyes open. 
So we're not going to be real followers until we believe with eyes open, not with eyes closed. We need to be awake, aware Muslims. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us an aware and awake ummah. May Allah build that foundation in us, in our families, in our youth, in our coming generations. And may Allah Azza wa Jal help us appreciate, understand, and live by this profound book and the sunnah of His beloved Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaqum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. We'll try to finish Ayatul Bir next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Laysa al-birra an tuwallu wujuhakum qibala al-mashriqi wal-maghribi walakin al-birra man amana billahi wal-yawm al-akhiri wal-malaikati wal-kitabi wal-nabiyin. وَآتَى الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ ذَوِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّائِلِينَ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَى الزَّكَاةَ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَى الزَّكَاةَ وَالْمُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا عَاهَدُوا وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ اللهم اجعلنا من الأبرار ومن المتقين ومن الذين صدقوا رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد uh, The last halaqa we had uh, I was talking to you about ayat al-bir uh, the ayah that describes goodness and we got through one portion of it the portion that deals with iman and the motives, the, the sequencing, believing in Allah and the last day and the angels and the books and the prophets and why this sequence is important in understanding, you know, that particular sequence has something to do with the motives for being good. And we discussed that last time. Now we're getting into the items beyond Iman. Just as a very quick reminder, it's like an image is being built. You've got the foundation of the building that's underneath and nobody sees where the foundation is, but it's supposed to be deep if the building is going to be strong. And then you build floors on top of that. Iman is like that. It's like the foundation you don't see. But all good deeds above that are built on top of it. And if that foundation isn't there, then you may be able to build something tall, but it won't withstand a storm. And you'll notice that at the end of this ayah, you will see a storm. You will see difficulty mentioned at the end of this ayah. And that's, that's particularly important because that last part of this, this ayah is impossible without the first part of this ayah. So it's like it's, you're being prepared for that conclusion. Nonetheless, the second, the, the first practical item mentioned after goodness is mentioned is وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ ذَوِ الْقُرْبَىٰ وَالْيَتَامَىٰ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّائِلِينَ وَفِ الرِّقَابِ This is a long list of things. And in this list of things, basically the verb is one, the action is one. آتَ الْمَالِ And this person would give wealth. Allah adds عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ by Mufassirun has been described in a multiple number of ways. One of them is that this person gives wealth because of his love of Allah, based on his love of Him, meaning based on his love of Allah. That love alone makes him spend money. Others say this ala is like a lid, yani lidda hubbihi, against his love. Love of what? His love of wealth. Meaning this person spends money even though he has love for that money. And this is actually very natural. You and I, when we earn our income, we give up a part of our life to earn that money. You know, we, we, we stay away from our families, and we stay away from our beds and our comforts, and we give up really a part of our life. The most important asset a human being has in this world is time. And to earn our paychecks, whether, whether it's through your business or through your jobs, you give up a part of your life to earn that living. So it's not just money sitting in the bank, it's really you paid a part of your life to get that. It's, it's a, so there's a natural attachment to your assets, to your wealth, and you know, yourself. Giving that up is like giving up a part of yourself. It really is. 
But this person who's attained, who's really deeply rooted in Iman, their understanding of spending money is easy. And despite that natural love, and Allah by saying ala hubbihi is telling us that loving wealth or being worried about wealth or being attached to having money, in and of itself is not an evil thing, it's gonna happen. You can't not have it, it's natural. From the very from, from childhood. You're gonna see a child holding on to a toy and his eyes will be on the toy he doesn't have in his hand. I want that one. Can I have that one? The, the one he has is no, no and then you, you, your kids, you give them Eid gifts. You give all of them Eid gifts. The first thing they'll do is check what did he get. That's what they're gonna do. And then they'll start doing an exchange program. Hey, I'll give you this one, you give me that one. And usually the big one cons the little ones, right? That's what happens. You know? But that, that's natural. A love of acquisition is there. And Allah says in this ayah, these people who have truly attained goodness and internalized it, they know that that love is there, but they fight against it. And they give despite that love. Then the question is, where do they spend that money? And this ayah is in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, it's a prioritization. You know, spending money, you can spend money in places where you can feel good about it. Even an atheist donates. They donate to humanitarian causes, don't they? You have non-believers that donate. You have, you have uh, people that have no iman at all. Before they die, they will pass off their entire estate to you know, the really old guy's school of uh, cancer research. And they'll put his statue there, right? So even he spends money. But where do these people, what's their priority list? Where do they spend number, money number one? Allah says, the will qurba. First recipients of their money, despite the, their love of that money, is those possessing the most closeness to them. Meaning, the closest relatives. But qurba is more open than that. It could even be people that are close to you in society. People that you interact with. Now the problem with that is, the people that are the closest to you are also the people that make you the most upset. They're also the people you have the most trouble with. Especially, you know, uh, many Muslims, they come from like extended families and, you know, back in the day, joint family system. If not joint family system, they're, you're living very close to one another. And when you and your wife and your kids are living very close to your brother and his, his wife and his kids and your, your, your wife's, you know, sister and their wife and their a lot of drama can happen between families. A lot of fighting can happen between families. And so when it comes to spending money on family that you've already had arguments with, it's very difficult. It's easy to come, go somewhere else and give strangers. Somebody asking outside the masjid, asking money, you give it to them. Oh, my uncle, I, I can't stand that guy. I'm not giving him anything. My cousin, I, I hate him. You know what he did last year? Oh, no way, I'm not giving him anything. You have to step on that, on, crush that, that sentiment inside of you. And by the way, Surah Al-Baqarah later on will deal with, and it's appropriate that it deals with this subject. Okay, it's one thing to give. It's another to give and say, you know, I shouldn't have given it to you. Next, next year. I knew you were never going to be grateful. I helped you for no reason. You, you, you gave money and later on you said things that hurt a person's feelings. Meaning you humiliated them, exposing that you had given them money like you're imposing it on them. لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى Towards the end of this surah. Don't cancel out all the things you've given by imposing it on people. Reminding them, you know what I did for you? <laughs> what a waste. And not by saying a word that would hurt somebody's feelings. You know, there's no point in doing that. If you're going to do that, might as well not even give. So this, the, the first recipient, the ones that are closest in the family. This, by the way, is impossible if you and I aren't close to our families. If you don't stay in touch with your family, you don't know who needs help and who doesn't need help. They all go their own ways and you see them maybe once in a while and you ask them very, very shallow, in disingenuous kinds of, how's it going? It's okay. Okay, you're okay then. And you just move on with life, right? You don't really ask deeper questions. You don't know what their job situation is, their saving situation is, their housing situation is, their health situation is, you know, their career situation. You don't know any of that stuff. If you're really connected with family, then you will know who needs help and who doesn't need help. And a lot of times within family, and this is again something we'll learn later on in this surah, you're gonna find people even within your own family or close within the community also that have a lot of respect for themselves. They're not gonna go around asking for money. You wouldn't know that they're in need of money until unless you really cared and you knew and then you kind of offered it yourself. And even if you would offer it yourself, they would start crying before they accepted it. Like they'd, they'd have a lot of reluctance and humiliation before they would take it because you know it's not, it's, it's not easy. 
You know, it's not easy to be the hand that receives, it's easier to be the hand that gives. So they don't want to put themselves in that position. La yas'aluna nasa ilhafan, Surah Al-Baqarah will tell us later on. They don't ask people wrapping themselves around people like a blanket. You know, Urdu speakers know lihaf, right? Lihaf. It says, la yas'aluna nasa ilhafan. Al-hafa, to wrap yourself around like a blanket. You've seen professional beggars, especially in the Muslim countries, or you go to Hajar Umrah or something, what are you going to find? You're going to find these, these, these professionals, they don't let you go. They hold on to you. You know, Fisa Bidillah, Fisa Bidillah, Jazakallah Khairan, Ya Akhi Filisah. You know, they don't let you go. You're not going to find your family like that. You're not going to find your you know, close friends like that. You have to know, be sensitive enough to figure that out yourself. So you, this, uh, this is the first recipient. Well, uh, then he says وَالْيَتَامَ And the orphans So the first thing by the way Just by saying we spend money in close relatives Means that we are in close ties with our family That teaches us that iman necessarily makes you a family man It makes you family concerned people Not just your nuclear family but extended family You keep in touch with people That's part of your religion now It becomes part of being good Subhanallah And then he says And they take care of orphans so Allah sep- maybe there's orphans in your family, but Allah separated this. So it's not just orphans within your family, it's even orphans outside your family. Now we're sitting in a masjid making salat. I don't know next to me there's an orphan. I don't know that. It doesn't wear, he doesn't wear a, you know, a sticker on his forehead that he's an orphan. I have no way of knowing. Except in a community, we're not just supposed to be people that stand next to each other and pray and then depart. We're not just people that are supposed to just say salam and move on. We're supposed to go to each other's homes. We should, we're supposed to know each other. And when we know each other, we realize who's got a family and who's an orphan and who's in this situation or that situation. So we know who to help. Just like the first case. So a real community would know its orphans. It's like these criteria that Allah has given us are not just gauges for you and me, whether we stand on goodness or not, whether a community stands on goodness or, on goodness or not. It's, it's amazing. That that's the standards we're supposed to look up to. If we say, you know, what should a community accomplish? This is what a community needs to accomplish. First of all, it reinforces into an individual that they should take care of their family. And then family should know one another. So we know the orphans within the community. Yatama. Then he says, Wal masakin. Miskin in Arabic is, uh, some argue, a combination of the roots masaka and sakana. They come together. Maskana. Maskana. Masaka means to stop, like imsak is to stop. Sakana is to remain stationary. A miskin is someone who is in a situation, you know, in Egyptian they say maznuq, like stuck. You can't get out of that situation. Maybe they're in a financial situation, maybe they're in a health situation, maybe they're in a political or immigration situation. Whatever situation there is, they're stuck, they can't get out of it. There's, they don't see any way out of it. This is called a miskin. When Bani Israel was stuck under the rule of Fir'aun and they couldn't escape, Allah said about them, وَضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَسْكَنَةِ Maskana was slapped upon them. They, they couldn't get out. They were stuck in that situation. So Allah says, you'll find in the community also there will be people that are miskeen. They can't help themselves. They're stuck in that. Maybe it's because of their health. Maybe it's because of whatever other situation. But they're, they're stuck. And this could be people that are abused. People that are stuck in a, you know, an abusive relationship. Children, children that, are, that are stuck in foster care. You know, this is actually a growing problem in the Muslim community. That, you know, because of abuse within our home, sometimes our, our kids are being given off to Christian families. This is, I've, I've seen actual stories like that. It's heartbreaking. It really is. But people that are stuck, this is al-miskeen. Then Allah goes further. And by the way, again, the miskeen is not someone you will know just by looking at their face. Though there is something about their face, if you're, you and I are really sensitive, we can look at their face and tell something's wrong. And Allah tells us that later on in this surah. He says, يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُوا أَغْنِيَاءَ مِنَ التَّعَفُّفِ تَعْرِفُهُمْ بِسِيمَاهُمْ The jahil, the ignorant one, the insensitive one, looks at them and thinks, oh, they don't need anything. They're okay. He's fine. I don't see a problem. I don't see him bleeding. It's okay. But Allah says, تَعْرِفُهُمْ بِسِيمَاهُمْ لَا يَسْأَلُوا لَلنَّاسَ إِلْحَافًا You will look, you'll recognize them by their faces. You know, people you really, really love, like your mother really loves you. You go home one time, have lunch at your mother's house, she looks at your face, she says, what's wrong? Nothing, mom. Tell me what's wrong, I know that face. She knows your face. She could tell something's wrong just from your face. You look at your wife. Hey, what's wrong? Nothing. Yeah, something's wrong. Tell me what's up. Why aren't you talking to me? Tell me. Because the face can tell the story. 
اللَّحْضُ أَسْلَقُوا إِمْبَاءً مِنَ اللَّفْضِ Observation can sometimes be more true than just the word itself. This is how sensitive a believer is supposed to be with the other believer. You know, a sunnah for example, just to teach you how things tie together in our deen. A sunnah in our deen is to smile at one another, isn't it? So a community gets used to that sunnah, and all of a sudden they see one brother, one sister, she's not smiling, he's not smiling. Immediately they're supposed to think, are you okay? Is everything alright? Subhanallah. Allah put these mechanisms there, so that we could become sensitive to each other. We're supposed to be the most humanitarian of all. This, this is way beyond humanitarianism. Way beyond any humanitarian. This is super sensitive to the sentiments, to the feelings of others, you know. And it's, it's, not, it's easy to talk about, it's very hard to live up to that, to transform oneself, to become that kind of a person. And this is the kind of person the Messenger of Allah was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is really the sunnah of the Messenger and of the Messengers. When you read the stories of the Messengers, one of the things you have to notice is how they respond to people, especially in personal situations. Because they are very sensitive to who they're dealing with and what they're hearing and how they should respond, you know. So nonetheless, this is وَالْيَتَامَ masakin. Then he says وَابْنَ sabin, And the, the, literally says the son of the path. The son of the path. You know the, 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 the new term for that is the road warrior. <laughs> the guy always traveling. The guy in the middle of travel. Now how do you know a traveler? How in the world are you supposed to see a traveler? Look, all the cars parked outside, it's not like we're gonna go check every license plate and see which one's not Texas. Well, we can know a traveler, you know how? If we know everyone in the community, then we know this guy's not from the community. Hey, are you new around here? You need any help? You know, and especially in a big community, it can become difficult, right? But that's what's supposed to be the case. We're actually supposed to be sensitive to the people around us, familiar faces, and we're supposed to say, hey, what's going on? Are you, are you traveling? Are you okay? Are you doing all right? This is Wabna Sabil. There's a culture, part of the culture that, that is inspired by the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that when somebody is traveling, we should compete with one another to take them in. We should compete because it's great hasanat, great rewards for those who take care of the guest. You know, this is the, it's like you're doing the sunnah of Ibrahim ﷺ, taking care of guests. The sunnah of Lut ﷺ, taking care of guests. Taking care of guests is something mentioned over and over in Qur'an. So you get to perform that sunnah. So now when people come over, like your friend comes over, your family comes over, some cousins come over, some weddings happening, somebody's coming over. You should be competing with one another saying, stay at my place. No, no, stay at my place, stay at my place. Instead of saying, hey, I, there's a hotel nearby, I'll send you an email. You know. And make sure you rent a car. <laughs> right? That's what we've become. We're supposed to be the other way around. Can you imagine living in a community like this? I mean, just, just picture it in your head. I know we're not there. We're nowhere near there. Nobody is. But I mean, just to think. Oh, that kind of world. To live in a community where people take care of each other. Families are always helping each other out. The orphans are known. Not because they're part of some organization. Where they're, they, they're brochu embarrassing brochures of their pictures on them. People just know them for who they are. And they take care of them. You know, because we attended their, their father's janaza, so we know who they are. We didn't just attend the janaza and left. Imagine living in a community, that, doesn't that sound like a beautiful thing? What a beautiful deen this is. When, when, some, when goodness is described in the Qur'an, al-birr, walakidna al-birra, in this ayat, when that foundation of iman is there, this can be built on top of that. Now if we're having a hard time building this, if we're hard, having a hard time building the first floor, what does that tell you? Something wrong with the foundation, subhanAllah. <laughs> there must be something wrong with, because this is supposed to be a natural result of the first, the, the foundation of this building. So Allah Azza wa Jal goes further and He says, وَسَائِلِينَ And He puts them at the end, two, two groups. وَسَائِلِينَ وَفِرْرِقَابِ Those who ask and those who are, they, they are in, the, in chains. Meaning they're, they're bonded by the neck. You know, the image of old slaves was they would wear a chain around their neck like a leash. Nowadays, you don't see anybody with a chain around their neck. But you might see somebody wrongfully incarcerated. You might see somebody with a chain around their neck. It's called credit card debt. It's called a student loan. It's called a mortgage they got into when they were stupid. You know, it's, got, it's called whatever it is. Those are chains around their neck too. But before them, Allah mentions the sa'ilin, those who ask. Nowadays when we think of giving, who do we think of giving? Number one, 
those who ask. Where is that mentioned in this list? Way at the bottom. Because we're supposed to be a community that is so sensitive that those who ask should never even be put in that position. They should never even be put in that position. So this is the last resort. And then if you didn't know the community, well, you weren't doing your job, somebody got buried under debt, you helped them out. Somebody, got, you know, somebody ended up in slavery, one way or another, you helped them out. This is wafir riqab. And you know, slavery takes different forms. It's political in nature sometimes, it's social in nature other times, it's economic in nature other times. There's economic slavery where people are enslaved to a job and they can't help themselves, they can't get out of that job, and the employer is paying them unfair wages because they know they can't get out of that job. You know, I'll tell you an old story, back in the day story, when I was in high school. When I, when I was in high school, uh, it's kind of the culture in New York, you just get a job. You don't sit around and just go to high school, you go, get a job. So I was looking for a job. I finally found a job with a Muslim guy <coughs> at a grocery store, a halal grocery store. He's like, yeah, you can work here, sure. Is this place minimum wage? He goes, yeah, it's minimum wage. Minimum wage back in the day, this is how tell you how old I am, $4.25. That was minimum wage, okay? So I was like, okay, I'll work there, sure. I worked there 10 hours, carrying rice bags and moving meat and this and that, 10 hours. At the end of the day, he goes, yeah, I'm ready to pay you now. He hands me 10 bucks. I was like, what's this? He goes, it's your pay. I was like, that's not minimum wage. He goes, it's pretty minimum, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, why, are you, why aren't you giving me the fair wages? And he goes, are you legal? Are you legal? I was like, what does that mean? And then later I understood, all the employees he had hired were people that had immigration problems. And he could pay them a dollar or 50 cents an hour because where are they gonna go find a work? Where are they gonna go find a job? So they can work 20 hours a day and get 20 bucks and then be happy too. So I handed him his $10 and I left. <laughs> like you can keep that. But that's what he would do. That's what you would think. Why would somebody come and ask me for a job unless they have some kind of problem? And if they have a problem, then I should take advantage of that. Muslim grocery store owner. Zindabad, right? SubhanAllah. This is also a firriqab. A person stuck in that situation. They can't help themselves. Being taken advantage of. You know? Well, then at the end of all of this, now this is a community of goodness. First floor, by the way. First floor. Now we build another floor on top of that. Allah Azza wa says, wa aqama salata wa ata zakata. And this person established salat. This person established salat. By the way, the first thing that Allah just mentioned when people spend money and they take care of all these different groups of people, if you describe that to someone, can you talk about that without even bringing up Islam? Is that possible? Sure. You can talk about taking care of your family and close friends and being fair to people and helping others out, etc, etc, etc. It's all humanitarian in nature, it's ethical in nature. It's the, it doesn't sound religious, it sounds more ethical. Which brings up an important comment or, or discussion that I alluded to before and needs to be completed. There are two different definitions of goodness in the world. There's the religious definition of goodness and there's the ethical definition of goodness. The religious definition of goodness is, man, this guy makes salat every day, he's at the masjid, look at him, he dresses like a religious man, he looks, his face looks religious. He's, every, every Ramadan he makes ihtikaf, every, you know, every year he goes to hajj, he makes umrah, he does this, he, this is a religiously good person, he's a good guy. He recites Qur'an all the time, he's studying deen, he's doing this and that, this is religious goodness. On the other hand, you have a guy that gives charity, he's good to his family, he takes care of his, you know, he's good to his wife, he's good to his parents. He's a nice guy. You might even see non-Muslims like that, nice people. They're very nice people, right? They had this, they gave away, some church recently in Dallas, this was last week, gave away one million dollars in goods. Not to needy people, they just opened their doors and said, here's one million dollars worth of toys, coats, you know, computers, TVs, VCR, whatever, DVD players, MP3 players, iPods, iPads, whatever, take it. Just take it, whoever wants it. This was their Eid Mubarak. This was their Thanksgiving thing. That's pretty cool. That's pretty nice, you know. So you'll find them do that. So now the thing is, religious goodness becomes the one, one thing, and ethical goodness, charitable goodness becomes... Another thing, there are two separate kinds of things. And you know why that's important to mention? Some people say, I'm good, but which kind? The religious kind. And the other one says, I don't have to be religious to be good, I'm already ethically good. 
I don't have to make salat to be a good person. I don't need to pray or grow a beard to be a nice person. I'm a good husband. I'm a good father. I'm a good, you know, I'm a good uh, uh, employee. I'm an honest employee. I stop at every red light. I, I will obey the law. I pay my taxes, etc., etc. I'm a good person. And so when these two things depart, then actually they start hating each other. People that are religiously serious start saying, these people think they're good. Look at them. They don't even worship Allah. <laughs> they're no good. And the other guys say, even Muslims, Muslims that become, we call them modern or liberal or secular or whatever, they're very ethical and they're usually involved in very humanitarian kinds of work. And when you ask them about religious behavior, they say, you want, you want, you want me to become like these mullahs? These, you know, these, these traditional mullahs that are so, they're mean to their families, they cheat in businesses, they're, the longer their beards are, the bigger scam artists they are. You want me to become like them? <laughs> no thanks. They hate on each other. What did Quran do? What did this ayah do? It starts with ethic, iman, which can't even be judged. Then it builds a foundation of ethical goodness that isn't just limited to yourself, it extends to your family and then your entire community. And then it combines that with وَأَقَامَ salata And he established salat. What kind of goodness is that? Religious goodness. It, Allah doesn't allow us to separate these two definitions. They're, part of, they're two sides of the same coin. They're part of one believer's personality. You know? It's, it's an incredible realization. Because you'll find people that side with one goodness or the other. Just the other day I was in conversation with someone. You figure out which side they were on. And they said, you know, why is it that when Muslims become more religious, they become more cut off from society, and they don't care about anybody else, and they get isolated, and they start... And this person that was asking me wasn't asking me, they were telling me. You know, sometimes people ask you, but they're not asking you. I was getting uncled at the time. It's, it's, there's a verb for that in Urdu, it's called getting uncled. Okay? Khatib, young khatibs get ready to be uncled after every khutbah. Okay? You usually get uncled. But anyway... So he's, this, he's going on and on and on and on, how they, the more religious they become, the more insensitive they become, and they justify everything, and they justify family abuse, and they justify you know, this and that or the other. Why are they like that? And on the other side you'll find, why are these Muslims so liberal? They go to parties, they go to concerts, and they think they're very good, etc., etc. Allah combines both of those. And the way to combine both of those is, first of all, you take this priority, وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ He established salat. By the way, what does salat in Arabic literally mean? Connection. Connection. Every salat is supposed to connect you back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Wa'ata zakata. And he gave zakat. Now when we think of giving zakat, don't we think of giving charity? But there's the, this is the second floor. But the first floor already dealt with what? Atal mala ala hubbihi. Atal mala ala hubbihi was giving money. And now on the second floor, establish prayer and give. Zakat. So it's giving money again. What's, what's it doing here? We're learning these, these are two separate categories. Zakat is the bare minimum religious obligation. This is religious goodness, right? It's a different area, different, different concern. The other thing here is Allah used the word zakat. Zakat literally from tazkiyah, purity, is the one who's religiously pure. The way we purify ourselves spiritually is salat. And even before we make salat spiritually, we're supposed to purify ourselves physically with what? Wudu. Just like that, we're supposed to purify our income with zakat. So that what goes into our mouth is clean. And by saying wa'at wa zakat by the way, it's a very deep statement. And I'll end with this statement. We're not going to be done with this ayah for a couple of weeks. Just I'll end with ata zakat and share something with you. It's very heavy. Zakat is supposed to purify your money. When we give that 2.5%, of our income per year, it's supposed to purify the rest of that money, making it halal for ourselves. But what if that 97.5% that you kept wasn't even halal to begin with? What if that money you earned came from haram sources? You can't purify something that is in and of itself impure. By Allah saying they give zakat, it already guarantees the way they consume their wealth is pure to begin with. Then they give zakat. This has already been covered in the surah. كُلُوا مِن طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا Consume the halal. Earn the halal. Earn the halal. Now, you know what happens when religious and ethical goodness separate ways? You can have an, a Muslim employer. A Muslim employer, he cheats. He lies to his customers. He fakes receipts and invoices to make an extra buck. But he makes sure he eats the biha chicken. 
He's earning haram money and he's using that haram money to buy halal meat. You think that's halal food he's putting in his family's mouth? No. That's not pure money. The way you earn that money is pure and the way you spend that money is to be pure too. It's both of those things. Then you're eating halal food. Halal food is not just how the animal is slaughtered. You can debate that till you're blue in the face. Let's talk about where the money came from that bought that meat to begin with. That, then, then you talk about ata zakata. He purified as well. And in this we learn, the last thing I'll share with you, when salat is established. Salat is established, by the way, salat cannot be established except in a masjid. This is the sunnah of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa when, when we heard in Qur'an, aqimus salata, aqamus salata, aqimus salata, this was always done in the masjid. There's salat, fasalla, he prayed. Then there's wa aqama salat, he established salat. The establishment of salat happens in the institution that establishes salat, which is the masjid. This is iqamat salat You can pray at home too, but the actual institution really only exists at the masjid. So this person actually already has a relationship with the masjid. And they have a, that, that relationship with the masjid, they're constantly worried about Allah. In between salat, they go back to business, they make sure they earn halal. And when they earn halal, they go back and connect to Allah, they say, I better, what I just earned in between the hours of business, uh, between the salat, I better go pray, give my zakat so it's pure for me. So salat makes you, your income pure. Because it makes you more cautious. It's like saying every few hours you stand in front of the IRS. How clean will your books be? If every few hours you stand in front of the IRS Seriously <laughs> Your records will be solid your, Every receipt will be saved Every few hours you stand in front of Allah Then you go back to business Then you stand in front of Allah Then you go back to business Then you stand in front of Allah Then you go back to business Isn't that the case? So zakat is mentioned as a result He's able to give zakat As a result of establishing salat Real salat will do that to a person this ayah of goodness is very deep. It creates a transformation inside the thinking of a person. What does it really mean to be a believer? What does it really mean to attain goodness? And we're still just on the second floor. We're not done yet. Inshallah ta'ala, next week we hope to be done. Or maybe there's four floors. So let's see if we can do three and four, or at least three next week, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم والصابرين في البأساء والضراء وحين البأس أولئك الذين صدقوا وأولئك هم المتقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه. We reached the end of Ayatul Bir. This is probably the ayah that I've taken the longest time on in this series on Al Baqarah. And uh, because it does deserve that kind of time, we've gone through a list of basically a, this, this building we've constructed of what it means to have goodness in the character of a Muslim. And at the end of this list, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions as sabirina We didn't get to talk about this last one in detail. I introduced it last time. And we'll inshallah ta'ala try and finish the ayah today. The word before was al-mufuna. And as you hear the ending, as I mentioned last time, also una, the marfu'a ending. It's the expected ending. But the word sabiruna is not used. Sabirina is used. So it's kind of unexpected that that format be used. Interestingly, there are some orientalists that actually, you know, um, uh, Orientalists make these uh, lists of alleged grammatical mistakes in the Qur'an and they make this count this as one of their alleged mistakes. Which is a subject in and of itself, why they do that and, and, and how really stupid it is that they do that. But nonetheless, they write these papers, then people who know even less than them approve of them, and then, you know, uh, then, then these like... Um, Evangelical, like aggressive evangelicals get a hold of it and they put it on their websites and they think that they are these original authors and it's all plagiarism off of someone who didn't know much to begin with and it just gets popularized and then Muslims, we don't know our language that well most Muslims are not very familiar with the Arabic language they read that kind of stuff and it starts messing with their heads but regardless in the, in the, and, and by the way, like our tafasir, the tafasir of the Muslims 
uh, the scholarly works on the Quran of the Muslims from centuries and centuries ago, even millennia ago, have dealt with this stuff. They've already explained this stuff. And explained that not, not only is it not a mistake, but actually they, that word never even comes up. Rather, what makes a Fabirina beautiful here? So we don't study it from the point of justifying, no, 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 it's not a mistake, it's actually correct, it's acceptable in Arabic. Actually, the other way around. We study it from the point of view of how perfect it is that Allah said, Ashabirina and not Ashabiruna. You know, it's the other way around. But we don't, you know, we're constantly apologizing, we're constantly justifying our religion, so we don't even have that kind of confidence to, to think, we don't have to respond to those claims. We just have to know our own book for its own sake, not because of what somebody else says about it. Regardless, in this list of things that we must accomplish, Allah Azza wa Jal makes this word, we call it mansub. Grammarians call it, call it anasb ala al-madh, or ala sabil al-madh. When you make, when you change the format of a word unexpectedly, to highlight it above all else. To highlight it above all else. If you have a list of things that are important, and nowadays when you're typing a list, you, t- you send it to your employee, right? These are the things I want you to do. And at the end of it, these are bullet lists, at the end of it, you take one of those items and you make it all caps and you make it bold and you underline it and you increase the font size and you make it blink. You know, you could do all of that. What are you trying to tell your employee? This one, you better make sure you get this one. All of this stuff is important, but this is the key. You better get this done. This was done in the Arabic language by Al-Nasb ala Sabil al-Mad. This is, actually happens a couple of places in the Quran. It is as though Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, yes, Iman is important, where the ayah began. Giving is critical, where the ayah went next. Establishing prayer and giving zakat is important. Aqam salata wa atas zakat. Fulfilling your promises is critical. But all of that hinges upon as-sabirin. You, and the real goodness is attained by those who persevere. Now interestingly, from a language point of view, the word bir, which the ayah began discussing, they said bir, walakin al bir. Bir, I told you, is compared to bahr in Arabic literacy. Like, uh, it's bir that comes from bar, and bar is land, and it's the opposite of bahr. From bir, we also get, uh, bar, we get the word bir, with the kasra that we're reading in this ayah, which gets translated as goodness. But it's actually stable goodness. Just like, you know, when somebody's traveling in the ocean, they don't know when a wave can come and the story will be over. It's an instability. And when they reach land, they're safe. They're good. So the word bid in and of itself has a connotation of stability. And so does the end of the ayah of Fabirin. Fabirin is essentially someone who's stable in their faith. When things are easy, they hold on to their iman. When things are difficult, they hold on to their iman. Now these difficulties can come in, in, in many ways. Allah Azza wa Jalla tests us in different ways. So Allah mentions three scenarios of holding on to our faith. But before I go to them, we should understand that it's probably not fair to translate sabr as patience. That is one part of what sabr means. Sabr does absolutely mean patience, but it means other things too. It means constancy. You know, you're, no matter what, you're going to stick to it. Like, you know somebody who goes to work on time every day, whether it's raining or it's snowing or it's bad traffic or they feel like it, they don't feel like it, they had an early light, they had a late night, they were sick, they'll show up. This is a kind of sabr also. It's, it's consistency. Perseverance. No matter what, I'm going to get this done. I'm not going to quit on this just because it's getting hard, or I'm not into it anymore, or whatever, I'm having a bad day. That is also sabr. That's part of the definition of sabr. So this consistency, this perseverance, this patience, these are the people of sabr. And Allah says, these are the people, at the end of the day, this quality, is what will, what will make all the other previous items that were mentioned validated or invalidated. Now what does that mean? Our iman goes up and down, yes? But it, there's a point in our iman below which we cannot afford to go. We can't compromise our faith. When it comes to the integrity of our faith, yes, we have high and lows, but there's a certain point beneath which we're not able to go. Like, you know, uh, I'll give you a practical example. There are some Muslims who enter academia. Muslim scholars or, or, or students, they do Islamic studies at a university. And in the university, most of their faculty professors are non-Muslims. And they have a certain attitude towards knowledge in general, and of course even Islamic knowledge. And that attitude is they are way, far, they're way too uh, academically superior to be impressed with anything. They constantly have to critique and criticize and talk down to what they're studying, because they themselves are above it. You know, this is the exact opposite to what a Muslim studies his, his deen or her deen. 
We know that the text, the, the word of Allah, the words of Allah's Messenger are way above us. We're no one to criticize them. So when we study them, we actually, we're, all we're studying is trying to appreciate, you know, the beauty of why it is so superior to what we would have to, what we have to come, uh, come up with. But in academia, it's the other way around. You're criticizing the work of an author. And you're giving it two stars or three stars or saying, I didn't like this passage, this could have been done better this way, etc., etc. So now a Muslim joins this program, and he's doing a PhD. And his professors are going to say all kinds of things about the Messenger of Allah, about the Qur'an. They're going to say all kinds of things, you know. But he has to kind of just hear it and just, it's okay, I need to finish my PhD. And they just constantly hear the stuff that any average Muslim would hear, and they would just, you know, they'd probably shut off. You know, they, they mentally would shut off. That would happen. But they can't, they have to just kind of listen to it. And there's, there may be some wisdom in just listening to their opinion and refuting it in an academic way, and that's fine. But eventually comes time for them to write, write their thesis. And now they have to mold their thesis to where their advisor would approve it. And sometimes they even have to write things that, they, that clearly are a compromise of their own things. And this happens. This actually happens quite a bit. There's not enough sub, there's not enough courage. Oh, I, I won't get a PhD, I won't get tenure, all my years will be wasted. So I might as well compromise what I truly believe or what holds up the integrity of this deen just to finish my paperwork. You know, subhanAllah. This, this is a, you know, this is at the academic level this can be challenged. At your work situation it can be challenged. People in the public sphere it can be challenged. I was at an, um, at an interfaith gathering in Long Island. This is, must have been 10 years ago, more than that. And uh, there was a, there was a, a minister, a, a, a Baptist minister. There was a reformist rabbi. And there was the imam and they asked me to come and speak too. And they were all sharing just some things about their faith and things like that. And the rabbi got up there and he said, this is, I'm just as well as I can remember. Because it, this, his words kind of got burnt onto my head. Because it was that shocking to me. He said, you know, in, in Reformed Judaism, we believe that God has gifted us with a very sharp intellect. And because of that, we're able to um, make amendments to God's law. Right? We can, because God, God gave us these words and God gave us our minds, so we can make amendments to God's law. And we can have, for example, originally there weren't, women couldn't lead our prayers and they couldn't be canonized, etc. But now in Reform Judaism, they can be, etc. And he started giving examples of it. And I'm looking like this, like, I thought you guys hid that. <laughs> I thought you didn't just come out and say that you changed Allah's word. Now they proudly say, well, you know, God has given us the intellect and that's superior to what he himself said. So we, we can figure our own way out. Wow. Incredible. But for, you know, and, you know, I kind of spoke out at the time and I kind of got in trouble. No, brother, we are our guests. We have to, you know, but yeah, but you have to speak. You can just say, oh, we appreciate that. It's the house of Allah, man. And they're not talking about some other God. They're talking about Allah Azza wa too. <laughs> no, we don't. How do you justify that? It's not just Orthodox Jews that should have a problem with that. Any believer in God should have a problem with that statement. Not to yell and scream at them, but at least to have a conversation. Like, what basis can you, how can you say that? You know? So we have to be people that speak up. And that requires a kind of sabr too. Because it requires the courage to deal with the consequences that way. Why do people compromise? They compromise because they're afraid of the consequences. That's basically when compromise happens. as sabirina Allah mentions the first thing, Al-Ba'sa. Al-Shawkani, rahmahullah, in his tafsir, says Al-Ba'sa, Al-Shidda, Wal-Faqr. He's the first word, Al-Ba'sa, which is difficult times. He says this is severe times and poverty. You could call it a recession. You could call it times of war. You can call it, you know, politically unstable times. In these kinds of times, people end up, they, they try to keep things safe. They want to put, you know, uh, uh, do what they can to survive. And sometimes what that means is compromising deen. Alhamdulillah, we live in, the, you know, in, a, in a cheaper state in the country. Texas is one of the most affordable places to live. But I spend most of my adult life in New York City. New York is one of the most expensive places to live on the planet. And you have Muslims living there, and sometimes it's very hard for them to get by or put their kids through school or whatever else, so they end up making some very un-Islamic financial decisions just to survive. Right? And they're looking at it as, look, it's tough times, so we're, we're going to put these restrictions of the deen on hold and go for it. 
landlords will buy their space and now the tenant comes and the tenant's a liquor store owner or they're, they're being offered a partnership in a liquor store. Do you know why Muslims even go into liquor stores? It's not just because, not, not because it's haram or they don't care or whatever. Because if you buy a, a, like a regular grocery store or something and you run that, you'll get your return on investment in maybe 10 years. You buy a liquor store, your return on investment, the entire investment you made, you get it back in six months. You get your money back in six, it's a gold mine. You know, أُولَٰئِكَ مَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ إِلَّا النَّارِ Right? They're not consuming anything except fire into their belly. But it's really tempting and it's expensive. I gotta put my kids through college, I got this expense, I gotta pay off the house, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. So people just kind of justify it and just go with the flow. Let's not talk about it, let's not deal with it. How many, how many of our families end up in student loans? Like really like loan shark type student loans. I, I, this is not just something we talk about. You know, the president's talking about how, you know, these student uh, loan institutions, financial institutions have taken advantage of students and there needs to be regulation in this industry. But we're talking about purely from a riba point of view. How many students? And I've told you this before, it's like really bad accounting that a guy goes to accounting school and pays $100,000 to get a bachelor's degree to get a job that pays $45,000. 40 of which is going to go into his expenses anyway. When is he going to pay off that 100 grand? That's accruing interest after like five years anyway. It's like, it's ridiculous. But we, we, we end ourselves, end, uh, end up doing these kinds of things. Uh, justifying it by times are hard. This is al Ba'sa. Then he says al barra which most Mufassirun comment is sickness or personal difficulty. When something other than finances or the overall situation in society, something very personal has happened to you. You've lost a job, you got into an accident, you got into some kind of difficulty, your family member got into some kind of difficulty. That's the time to hold on to patience, to hold on to your deen, to not lose hope. You know, and this sabr sometimes is not just compromising deen, but compromising one's faith. You know, I, I can think of several examples of people that when they have a traumatic experience in life, their iman gets shaken. Like they just stop complaining, they start complaining about Allah and things like that, when, when the iman is shaken. And, you know, we, we beg Allah that He doesn't put us in those kinds of situations. But I've seen them. Like this brother who was really, he really, really loved his mother. And we all do. But he had this unusual love for his mother. And she passed away, rahimahullah. And he came into the masjid crying like a month later. Right? Came into the masjid crying saying, why did Allah do this to me? What kind of God? Why, doesn't, why, why would He do that to her? To her? Why would He let, let her die, etc., etc. And he's asking these questions which are basically... You know, his faith is shaken because of the trauma he went through. It's sabr that wasn't there. Iman must have been there before. He believes in God. But that lack of sabr destroys his iman. You can eat away at it. There was an 18 year old I knew in Long Island who got into a car accident and he was basically being kept alive by a machine. You know, those breathing machines. And so, I mean, his mother, you should, just, you should have just seen her. And it's, and it's easy to talk about because we're not in that situation, right? But Allah is saying this is the climax of faith. This is when your faith is really, really tested. And to put it in perspective, then you, you and I learn that the, the, the stories Allah mentions in the Qur'an aren't stories. This is real life stuff. Like you know, if you even hear on the news some child has been kidnapped and they found his shirt, like you would, if you're a parent, you would just change the channel. You'd be so disturbed. I know I couldn't watch the rest of the report. I couldn't do it. It's too disturbing. All these like football coach you know, scandals that are happening, it comes on the radio, I just turn it off, I can't take it. Like I can't, you, you can't tolerate it. You can't tolerate e- hearing about children going through those kinds of things. Look at Yusuf I mean, if that, if that was happening now, it would be on CNN. This boy's shirt was found, and his brothers have pled not guilty, and you know? We'd be super disturbed, but to us it's just become a story. And at the end of it all, it's such a traumatic experience where a parent could lose their mind. What are the words of Yaqub alayhi salam? Sabrun jameel. Right? Because we're learning real life stuff from that. That's, that's, a, that's faith that can stand a test. And that's a serious test. SubhanAllah. You know? This is what barra. You know, pain, difficulty, har- uh, literally harm that comes your way. What barra. Waheen al And in the midst of the battlefield, this is the worst of the worst. You know when the battle begins, before the battle begins, soldiers are fired up. Maybe they're nervous, but they're fired up. The, you know, the, the pep talk by the general, we're going to get them, and etc., etc. And they're chanting, and they're you know, beating their, their spears into the ground, and they're making noise, etc. There's this confidence. When the chaos of battle happens, all of that disappears. All of that disappears. 
And I'm not just telling you that in theory. This is something Allah describes Himself. The young Sahaba from Medina had never been in battle with the Prophet. Some these are new Muslims. And actually some of them had joined Islam after Badr. So Badr's already happened, they didn't get to participate in Badr, but they heard the stories about Badr obviously. And now there's a discussion whether we should go out and fight in the middle of the field in Uhud, or should we fight from Medina itself? Should we go out and face the enemy, or should we stay inside Medina? The Prophet ﷺ's suggestion himself was we should stay in Medina. Some of the young Sahaba said, no Ya Rasulullah, we didn't get to taste the opportunity for Shahada, we should go out there in the middle of the field, we should take on the enemy, come on, let's do this, you know. Allah describes the scene. Because you know what happened at Badr, uh, Uhud, it didn't go that well, right? So Allah describes this enthusiasm in the beginning, Surah so Al-Imran. He says, وَلَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ تَمَنَّوْنَ الْمَوْتَى مِنْ قَوْلِ أَنْ تَلْقَوْهُ You used to be wishing for death before you came into contact with it. فَقَدْ رَأَيْتُمُهُ Then you were just staring at it. وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ You were just, you were looking at it and you were just staring like, oh, what happened? What just happened? They got stunned. So this is not just something that you and I will be challenged with. This is something that the Sahaba were challenged with. You know? This is something that's, it's a human phenomenon. So Allah says that the, at the climax of patience, or, or, or goodness, is someone who can hold on to their iman in those most difficult of trials. You know? And so, speaking, you know, this is mentioned in theory in, ba- in Baqarah, and preparatory dis- discussions are in Baqarah, the practical sample from the Prophet's life itself will be given in Ali Imran. That's going to come in Ali Imran. And there even after Uhud happened, and the Muslims are injured, and their morale is like, couldn't be lower, because they literally is, تُسْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْوُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ When you were climbing up the mountain, weren't even turning back to check on anybody else. You were trying to save yourselves. The Muslims had to retreat. And then Abu Sufyan tr- talked trash and left. At that point, the Messenger of Allah, when they had gone, news came that Abu Sufyan and Khalid ibn Walid is thinking that they should come back for round two and just finish the Muslims off. They've already beat the Muslims, and Muslims have suffered a severe loss. They're thinking about coming back. And at that point, the Prophet ﷺ turns to the injured Sahaba, whose morale is way low, and he says, let's go after them instead. I mean, imagine this scene. These guys have just, just taken a horrible... I mean, 70 of the great Sahaba have just been killed in battle. It's the exact opposite of Badr. In Badr, 70 Muslims, 70 of the leaders of Quraysh were killed. It's the exact opposite. It, you know, uh, and, and in this scenario, the messenger said, let's go. Let's go after them. And the Sahaba got up. Let's go. That's sabr. And that's something Allah describes at the end of Ali Imran, that that's what real sabr is. You know? And Allah, Allah dis, you know, displays His pleasure with those people, radiallahu anhum. That they showed that kind of courage in face of all odds. You know, and Abu Sufyan heard they're coming back, so he ran away. <laughs> he decided, oh, maybe, maybe they're regrouping. So maybe that was a bad idea. So they just, they headed home. Regardless, this is Heen al Bas, in the midst of the battle. In the midst of the battle. وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ One last example of الصَّابِرِينَ حِينَ الْبَأْسِ Patient, perseverance, holding on to your commitments in the midst of the battlefield. A rumor was spread. And the rumor was that the messenger has been killed. In Uhud, a rumor was spread that the messenger has been killed because he was knocked down and a tooth of his was shaheed also. And he was passed out. He was unconscious. Uh, and he woke up after a while. So because of that, a rumor spread that he's been killed. Umar radiallahu anhu loves the Prophet intensely and he's a very intense personality, right? He heard it in the middle of the Can you imagine in the middle of the battle, people killing each other, swords flying everywhere? He just sticks his sword into the ground and sits on the floor. He goes, what's the point now? He just had a breakdown right there. <laughs> you know? And then, he had, then he heard that, no, it hasn't happened. So he got up and started fighting again. And so Allah commented about that in Ali Imran. If he died or he was killed, you just turned back on your heels? Is that your case? You have to be consistent. I don't know. You know, this is, so we, we see the samplings of what Allah is describing here, but these are prep, this is preparation for what's coming. So, wahin al that's in the midst of the battle also. How does this apply for us? Alhamdulillah, we're not in the middle of a battlefield. Alhamdulillah. And Allah only tests people in accordance with their ability, right? So Allah Azza wa has given us tests, and I tell you, most of us, we're not tested with difficulty, we're tested with ease. We're tested with facility and opportunity and free time and 
health and wealth and you know we're tested with these things you know and youth we, we have to be, become people of sub, people of sabr and understand good or bad we are here to take a test and we have to stick out you know we have to be perseverant I'll give, give you a parallel attitude and inshallah ta'ala will conclude the ayah just, a, just as an example to help you understand what kind of attitude you and I have to have in life you know there, there are students that understand the lesson and they're doing well on the test they got a student got a hundred on the test and he strolls in the next day late to class you know what's going on in his head? I'm doing okay I can afford to be a little late or he studies a little less for the next exam because I already got a hundred so even if I get a ninety on this one it's okay I think I'm ninety five average I should be alright I can take it easy because I you know I'm, I'm ahead of the curve he can become relaxed there's, those, there's the other student who says, well, I'm not doing bad, so might as well just accept the fact that I'm a loser and stay on mental vacation for the rest of the pro. You know, there's that too. Same thing happens with the believer and their relationship with Allah. Somebody might think, I'm okay, I'm, I'm not a bad person, I can take it easy. I don't have to take anything that seriously, you know. And they could take a break, they're going well, everything's going good, and they take a little break, but that little break becomes destruction. It just, they just fall apart. Everything falls apart. One little break, one little lapse, and it just takes you away. And on the other hand, there's someone who messed up a couple of times and figured, oh, what's the point? Now I'm going to hell anyway. Might as well party. Might as well live it up, you know? So this is, this is a lack of sabr. We have to have consistency. Then there's this, no matter what, I came to learn. Whether I got a hundred or a zero, doesn't matter. I'm here to learn, not for scores. I'm going to put my time in and I'm going to study. I'm going to do my work. I'm going to show up on time. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. This is a sabit. This is a sabit. Consistency, constancy. I'm going to stay on point. So that attitude of the student, the attitude of an employee, is the attitude of a believer in their relationship with their deen. This is a sabit. So Allah says about these people, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا Those are the people that have spoken the truth. They're the truthful ones. Now what does that mean, they're the truthful ones? When they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, I bear witness that there is no God except Allah, no, no entity worthy of worship or obedience except Allah, and that Muhammad sallam, is his messenger, sallam. everybody testifies to that, but Allah says their testimony is true. They're the ones that are actually telling the truth. I want you to understand this subtle point, because it's a very powerful point. There's a difference between saying La ilaha illallah and saying Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I want you to understand that difference. I think all of you know what I'm saying. When you say La ilaha illallah, you've declared a fact. When you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, you've declared your testimony. Yes? Now, when someone goes into court, or let me not give you a court example, let me give you a different example. An atheist says La ilaha illallah. And if he says the words, La ilaha illallah, does he mean it or no? He doesn't mean it. But what he said is still true. What he said is still true even though he doesn't mean it. If he says, so he, he's not a liar. At that point, when he says, La ilaha illallah, he's not a liar. But if he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, I testify, La ilaha illallah, and he's an atheist. Is he a liar or no? Yep. Once you say you've testified to it, now you're a liar or truthful. If you just say la ilaha illallah, that's the truth anyway. Whether you mean it or not, that fact is true. Right? So Ashhadu makes all the difference. The Muslim is the one who testifies to this truth. That truth that Islam is, is, is the haq, it's the truth, is always there. But whether you're truthful or not, is determined by whether you carry out this, these qualifications. Everybody will be saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. The munafiqoon came to the messenger, alayhi salatu wa salam, and they said in Surah al now you'll appreciate those ayat, qalu nashhadu inna kana rasulullah. They came to the messenger and say, we testify, you're definitely Allah's messenger. Hypocrites came to the Prophet and said, we testify, you are definitely Allah's messenger. That statement is half true. If they just said, you are Allah's messenger, that's true no matter what. But they didn't say that, they said, we testify, you're Allah's messenger. The ayah goes on to say, Allah knows you're his messenger, and Allah also testifies that they are liars. Wallahu yashhadu inna al munafiqina lakadibun. Hypocrites are liars. But they didn't speak a lie, except the part where they said they testify. But if you look at them, they're praying with the messenger, 
they're, they're complimenting the messenger, they're saying sallallahu alayhi wa when his name is said. How are they liars? Because here Allah is describing the people that are truthful, it's in their actions. It's in the foundation of iman and how they build their character. When that's not there, then you can fool yourself and others into thinking you really have iman, but you don't. That's, that's the powerful thing about this ayah. It makes a believer constantly want to check him or herself. They're never at ease. Am I, do I stand on the side of iman or on nifaq? Where, where do I stand? You can't be satisfied now. And so now, these are the people that are truthful. I told you in the beginning, there was a comparison between land and ocean, yes? Which one is safe? Land is safer than ocean. If these are the people that are truthful in their claim, then they're actually what? Safe. So Allah says, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ And those are the people that have actually, in fact, protected themselves. اِتَّقَى يَتَّقِي In Arabic doesn't mean to fear as many of you have heard. It's to actually be able to protect yourself out of fear. اِتَّقَى يَتَّقِي means to protect yourself out of fear. So a muttaq is someone able to protect himself because he's afraid. Not fear itself, what you do because of fear. Fear itself in Arabic is khawf. Now, Umar bin Khattab's definition of taqwa and al-end, very, very famous definition, you guys know it, is to walk through a thorny path, and you've got clothes, and you're trying to hold them, like crunch them together, so they don't get caught in the thorns, yes? Isn't that an act of someone protecting themselves out of fear? That's what that is, isn't it? In the beginning, Allah mentions the place of safety, land, goodness. And at the end of it says, if you, you can fulfill this, you've in fact protected yourself. You're the ones that are safe. Those are the people that are in fact al-muttaqoon. And tie this back to the beginning of the surah. Allah Azza wa said, this guidance is for those people who want to protect themselves. This is explaining, what, is, what, is, what do people that believe in this guidance look like? What does their personality look like? What qualities does it have? May Allah Azza wa make us a people of birr, a people of goodness. May Allah Azza wa Jal count us among those who are truthful in their claim. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who truly have taqwa. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.